The study of economics is all about forward progress. The basic equation of, say, GDP, right? The GDP is basically the, the element of productivity times labor. And there is no negative model of economics. I think one of the interesting things to consider, what does an economic model look like when it shrinks, when it's, when it's negative? Today, we welcome Dustin Whitney to the pod. With over 25 years as a business executive and entrepreneur and author of Demographic Deception, Exposing the Overpopulation Myth and Building a Resilient Future, Dustin helps businesses navigate global trends for sustained growth and is today's guest on El Podcast. Thank you, Dustin, for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Jesse. I really appreciate it. I've just recently reread your book, so I have some quotes fresh in my mind. So I'm just going to kind of start with this quote from your book, The Demographic Deception, to set this, this podcast up. You say in your book, quote, We've talked a lot about problems associated with aging societies, having too few workers, producing too few goods and services, results in de decreased productivity, lower profit margins, higher prices, reduced demand for consumer goods, rising inflation, rising interest rates, reduced risk capital for entrepreneurs, decreased growth or none at all, the collapse of popular social services such as national health insurance and social security programs, government defaulting on debt, dot, dot, dot. You get the idea. This silver tsunami threatens to swamp societies around the globe. In 2024, what would you say, what would you say, Dustin? Are most people surprised when you tell them that population collapse is, is more of an imminent threat than overpopulation? What do you say to that? Well, virtually everybody, I would, I would say, believes that we have too many people. Population growth is going up and up and up versus the things that I'm raising in, in the book about them coming down. I, there aren't too many people I've come across that are of the opinion that I am, probably one of the motivating factors of me writing the book, and it's run the gamut. I, I've, I've mentioned some of these things to certain people and I've almost been slapped or hit, and you know, people look upon me as saying, "Geez, I, I thought I liked you. You know, I respect your opinion, but you're you're coming out of this crazy place." So, very much so, I believe most people believe the opposite of of the things that I'm bringing up for sure. I had Daryl Bricker who wrote Empty Planet, and his book was like five years ago. And I asked him, like, "Oh, you know, what do people think?" And he's like, "Well, when I first started, people kind of thought I was crazy, but now it's seems like it's being ac accepted. But you still don't think that's." common knowledge. You don't think it's still being accepted? I, I don't. Yeah. I, and, and again, that's probably one of the major reasons why I, I went down this path of, of actually writing the book. Uh, the, the, the people that I interface with in, in my various sectors of, of, of business and, and enterprise and innovation and such, the prevailing thought is definitely that population growth remains to be uh, a really big problem. I suppose you're seeking out interesting questions and in and, and topics in your regular reading of books and in your podcast. And certain people are going to hit that circle of thinking that way in modern day. But for the most part, it's really quite misunderstood of a topic. And uh, I, I think it's, it's a major problem. And when you read that opening quote, you can see how pessimistic that the approach could be. And in fact, when I first started talking to some people about it, I was kind of looked upon as the doom and gloom person. And that's the reason why the subtitle of the book really is Building a Resilient Future, because I do think that there are a lot of things that we can do to to more adequately prepare and, and plan effectively for these changes. As I mentioned with your brief intro that or your brief bio on the intro that you have over 25 years experience as a business executive and entrepreneur, you're kind of looking at this more from a, a business perspective. What was your motivation originally to get into this topic? Well, I, I, I think, you know, by virtue of, of who I am, I'm, I tend to be very curious and I, I just try to follow interesting thoughts in my mind. I, I came across a whole lot of situations in my various conversations, business dealings with a lot of different people and groups of people. And what I was seeing firsthand in the real world 
was not really agreeing with what I had thought in, in, as, as truth and, and fact, things like long-term labor shortages well before COVID came into the picture, uh, difficulty with adequate pipelines of, of certain career paths. So the things that I was seeing in, in the real world made me think about it and look into it. And that's when I kind of took a deep dive into the numbers because I'm, I'm really a numbers person. And, and I went deep into numbers for probably two years or so looking at things, understanding the trajectories, who's out there, who does these these projection models. And so the, the curiosity of my stark observations in the, in the real world was really probably the beginning of my real curiosity of it. I've read a lot of books on this topic, you know, the demographic kind of decline, population decline. Well, you know, Daryl Brooker on actually had Marion Tupi in his book, Super Abundance. Um, mm, Paul great Moore. book. I like that. Yeah, it's, yeah, mm. it's a great book. We have Paul Moreland. UK's leading demographer. I just had Shamil Ishmael, who is from South Africa, and he has a book uh, on it as well. But one of the the chapters in your book that I liked, that I, th I feel like a lot of these other books didn't have, was what you talked about with how they actually model. Like, what is a population model, and how do they even come up with these numbers anyways? And in your book, you basically said that Population mod modelers use the following three main metrics to forecast changes in the size of a particular population. Fertility, mortality, and immigration of these three inputs, fertility, mortality, and immigration. Immigration is the hardest to forecast and therefore the most challenging to model. But you mentioned about how the UN has a model which is generally considered to be the most reliable, but there's other organizations that have much differing views. So can you talk about the UN and some of these other modelers around the world and how they differ and how this data is collected and how they come up with these numbers? Yeah, that's probably one of the more uh, curious places that I really started because in, in my world, in the business world, uh, modeling is, 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 is essential to all business operations. Whether you're looking at something as simple as a mom and pop restaurant, being able to understand how many customers they're going to have at a certain time period, how much food to to buy and prepare, how many workers to have on their staff at any particular time, to, to the exactly opposite of, of major manufacturing companies with large CapEx programs and factories that need to be built and supply chains that need to be relied upon. So it's real common in the business world, in, in all shapes and sizes, to to have a handle on projections, forecasts, modeling, whatever terminology you want to use. And there's a regular feedback loop to those kinds of evaluations. Sometimes you, you, you come off it really, really wrong. And then you, you need to reevaluate. Say, geez, how did I miss that one so much? And, and you know, if you're a small restaurant, for example, you order too much prime rib to be served on Friday night, and you're not going to go through it. Well, you can make soup the next day and serve it as a special kind of thing, right? And, that, and that's a regular practice for a lot of different small businesses, large businesses alike. And it's that feedback loop, which is really, really important. So the, the modelers out there, especially at the UN, right? So the UN formed just after World War II, and the, the Census Bureau really stood up. The United States Census Bureau really stood up or had a big hand in standing up the population division of the UN. Most, most statisticians suggest that the Census Bureau, the US Census Bureau would be kind of the the beginnings of statistical modeling and the use of it. And that makes a lot of sense because, of course, our, our government, the United States government, has a core function based on the population, the, the makeup of our legislature in Washington, D.C., and the regular allocation of resources from the federal government. It comes directly from our population and, and, and where they are and where they aren't. And so the U.N., the Population Division, really was, was stood up just after World War II, and the inputs that you described there, right? You have basically how many people are being born, how many people are dying, and how many people are moving around. It's not all that complicated to a certain degree. And if you're talking about the totality of the world, people aren't leaving the world and coming back into the world. So the immigration is kind of a, 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 a zero-sum game at the, the very top end. One of the things that has noticeably happened is there's been a dramatic change in the fertility rates uh, across the country, across the globe. 
And it really is a, a global topic. And certain countries are on the leading edge of it. Certain co- countries are on the on the tail end of it. But it is an, uh, an absolute tangible trend that's been happening for some time. And the challenge with the modeling that's been heavily relied upon out there is that it's been chasing the fertility number down. The, the really, in, in a very simple statement, the world population has been growing so radically over the last several decades, not because people have been born, but mostly because people have been not dying. We've been preventing deaths in all parts of the world, young and old. And so the modelers, uh, when you when you look at the top level, have been reasonably accurate over the last 25, 35, 40 years because almost the errors of predicting too many births have been canceled out by predicting too many deaths. And then it's, it's this key element of fertility rate which has caught the modelers by surprise. And from a business standpoint, that's one of those important feedback loops that if you don't recognize and change, then you're going to continuously produce numbers that perhaps could be a lot more accurate. One of the parts in your book, I think it was earlier on in the book, but it's like, you know, why does this information matter? And you talked about, I think maybe like the town you live in, you know, in the Boston area has... I believe it was like three schools and they're talking about trying to build a fourth school. But then if you start looking at how many kids are being born and how many kids are five and four and three years old and two years old, and it's like every subsequent age group has less of a, of, you know, less kids basically. So why would you build a, another school when in 10 years from now, you're going to have say 30, 40, 50% less kids and like again, like why would you build, you know, do you need to revamp an airport? You know, there's all these other infrastructure projects that you can look at based on the population. And as you, you, you kind of mentioned in the book, if the UN, if their numbers are wrong, then bi- massive business decisions, government decisions are based on this data. So like this has real world implications, whether it's small town, like you're mentioning with the school or larger governmental worldwide trends uh, a- absolutely it uh, that can't be uh, stated enough to be honest with you it it has the implications from the most small to the largest and so yeah in the book I, I kind of make it uh, a connection to my town here in the south area of Boston but that concept of proper planning and, and understanding what's in front of us is an essential absolute essential piece of not just business and commerce, but just daily economic existence. And the numbers are wrong. And, and, and they're becoming more and more proving that to be the case. There needs to be an understanding of what the inputs are. And the, the challenge, too, is that it's a, it's a hard topic to really grasp. because So let's just noodle on that, that school topic, for, for example, right? So I'm here in the in the, the, the southern suburbs of Boston, and so uh, we we have a, a fairly well-to-do community. Uh, my wife and I moved into this community to start a family. I'm a, I'm a big believer in public school systems here in America, and we have a good a good system here in the town that I live in. And when the concept of one one school is becoming old and it needs to be replaced. It, it's it's a basic idea of a community to say, all right, well, we got an old aging school; it needs to be replaced. Let's replace it, and it becomes a very matter of fact conversation. Unfortunately, there's no real check and balance there to understand that over the last 15 years, the actual attendance of the school system has gone down. Now, there are also people that would be involved in, say, the school committee or a local government people that might suggest, well, maybe people are trying to choose different schools, right? Maybe they're going to more public schools or, or, or parochial schools. And that's okay, except you got to really get to the bottom line answer. Uh, I'll take it one step further. The, there's, a, there's a major hospital system not too far down the road here that services this entire region of the state. And the least profitable part of their business is everything associated with young children. The birthing unit, they can't keep staff, they don't have enough people coming in. 
And when the planners of that hospital system are together, they sit around and they talk and they look at it upon a, a market share situation. They'll think to themselves, well, people are choosing to have more children, the birth of their children in the city. And, uh, you know, we're 15, 20 miles south of Boston. And of course, Boston has fantastic medical institutions and all that. And again, that's a reasonable argument, except that the Boston hospitals also have the same problem. Their birthing units are, are going through a lot of the same challenges. So you kind of need to just step back and say, what's going on here? And that's what I'm trying to do with the book. Back to the opening quote I had, I think there's a lot of people, if you're talking about like, hey, there's population collapse, a lot of people are like, yeah, it's great. That's going to only benefit humanity. There's going to be less people on the planet. I can go to Six Flags and not wait in line or whatever. There's a, a, a few benefits, but the the negatives by far outweigh the, the positives. And I think like people will be like, oh yeah, I'll be easier to buy a house. Well, maybe. But the housing prices are going to collapse. And like you mentioned that opening quote, inflation is going to increase. The workers will demand more money because there's less workers. But that means the price of all goods and services will also go, go up. So is your purchasing power actually any better? Probably not. Of course, you don't have the tax revenue. So how, how are we going to pay Social Security? I think you mentioned in the book in like 1940, I think there was right around 42 workers for every one person pay, uh 42 people paying into social security for every one person receiving benefits. And now it's less than three to one. So what happens when that's two to one or one to one? I mean, you call it the silver tsunami. The number of drawbacks are overpowering compared to the number of benefits. Is this correct? I, I think so. As you, as you look at it as a whole, there are definitely some, some benefits of the whole thought of, of having fewer people, not just in our, in our country here in America, but across the globe. And there's a chapter in the book that definitely talks about the good things that, that are happening or can happen as a result of that. Yeah. They, they, and those are considerable, right? You don't want to overlook those things. The impact of environmental concerns and food quality and abundance and availability of, of jobs and opportunities and poorer countries being able to have an opportunity to develop further and improve their living situations. All a lot of great things that can happen to it. But uh, on the whole, yeah, there's there's a lot more challenges associated with it than anything else. And you really need to look at it in that, that context. And I, I try to stay very policy agnostic. I certainly have my opinions on things. Uh, but I got to tell you, I, I really think it's important to understand the facts. And once you understand the facts, you can kind of decide what you want to do about something. But you you really can't choose what facts to pay attention to. You have to really look at things in its total and select that. So to answer your question, absolutely, I think there are definitely more challenges and bad things associated with the topic than good. However, if we plan a court, a, a properly, we can, we can navigate these waters and certainly overcome them. Looking at this from an investor, entrepreneur, business executive, you're researching this book. What's the information that people can take from this book and apply to their business or local government, whatever, to kind of mitigate the pending population decline? Well, first and foremost, you have to absolutely reconsider what business you're in and what business are you going to be in in the future? Because they're different. They're absolutely different. There's two fundamental issues. One has to do with production. One has to do with consumption. If you look at it, basically, workers, people of the age of, say, 15 to 64, right, big group of people there, those people produce, whether it's uh, they, they, they work, they're, they're actively supporting the economic system, and then people say over the age of 65 have more of a tendency to consume. Now, that doesn't mean to suggest that a 70-year-old is all a consumer and not a producer. There's definitely different uh, takes on that. But on its face, generally, older people need the support of younger people. So from a business standpoint, you've got a question of what's your customer base and what's the future of that customer and, and how does that marry up to the product or service that you're offering? And chances are there's something there that needs to be evaluated and, and probably changed quite a bit. Uh, the, the, the future of commerce in these circumstances 
the winners and losers will be picked by those people that are that are adequately prepared and, and, and planned out. So the first real thing that uh, any business enterprise or operation needs to consider is understand exactly what's really happening around you. Take a good evaluation of what your business is, what it relies on, and then think about what it looks like moving forward with fewer young people, more old pe- older people, and how does that change the landscape of what you're involved with? One of the major intersections of solutions here is the opportunities associated with technology. So when, when the conversation today of robotics and artificial intelligence, when people explore those topics for, for the most part, they're concerned about displacement of workers, right? jobs being taken over by robots, by the AIs. And I look at it very differently. The way I look at it is those elements of technology can actually help improve things and actually accomplish something that could not normally be accomplished in the absence of of labor. So the long-term labor shortages that we saw in the early onset of of COVID and the pandemic, I I would say to those business people, what happened to your world then? How does that play out since? What does it look like if those long-term situations continue? If that shortages of labor, that the challenge of the supply chain, the inability to get the goods when you want them, how you want them, and perhaps having the labor on hand to perform the work you need to perform. So there's basic elements of proper planning and strategic uh, direction that's absolutely essential. And, and that's kind of one of the things that I'm trying to do in, in the book is raise the level of awareness of the topic and to make sure that businesses and people are, are thinking about this and, and taking all the steps they, they need to, to plan accordingly. So are we already experiencing kind of a population decline right now in terms of, is this why that you're mentioning the supply chain and, and some of those things where prices have gone up? Is that a part of the factor? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So let's look at say, uh, labor, right? Labor shortages, right? So when, when COVID hit, to no surprise, frontline workers, say, in the hospital systems, it was pretty, pretty dramatic working conditions, right? Nurses out there, not enough protective equipment, all sorts of unknowns of exactly what COVID is, was, was going to do. And so that the, those workers were put under a lot of stress, and, and a lot of them chose to exit the that... Um, that sector of the industry and their occupation, Uh, whether it's early retirements or maybe they were right on retirement. Uh, Maybe it was they uh, wanted to uh, get into something that was a little bit less stressful and and decided to pivot into a different job. One important thing about that, though, is the nursing industry was facing extreme shortages of labor well before COVID. And so those sectors of our economy, say in America, that are facing long-term persistent labor shortages right now are simply those industries that were more vulnerable going into this pivot time period. So things like uh, manufacturing, nursing, like I said, school bus drivers, teachers, doctors in general. We've had a shortages of those people for a long time. And in particular, if you looked at the average age of those occupations, they were on the the latter stages of it, and they didn't have adequate pipelines of younger people. And so it's not a complicated situation. You know, you've got people retiring on a regular basis, and you're not keeping up with hiring. You can can have all the job fairs you want, but if if those people aren't in the pipelines, whether they're in the colleges or the are the training schools or, or, or preparatory programs that require a certain vocation to happen, uh, you're not going to realize that that gain. And, and you, can, you can try to res- reskill people if you'd like, but that reskilling concept, you, ha- you have to have a worker to be able to teach them something new to do. So the whole concept of reskilling needs to be con- reconsidered as well. So in the U.S., the fertility rate basically has been below replacement rate since just after the Great Financial cr- uh, Recession in 2009. Before then, it was above it. Do you think this ship can kind of be be turned around, at least in the U.S.? I mean, I think globally, like Japan, South Korea, China, Eastern Europe, hell, Western Europe for that matter, they're so far 
behind the replacement rate and have been for, in the case of Europe, for decades, same thing with Japan. Do you think like specifically in the U.S. we're actually able to turn this fertility ship around? Well, let's 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 pull that apart a little bit because there are a lot of people that have uh, have mentioned those those same kind of timelines and some of the other authors you've had on on your podcast uh, say the same kind of thing. I would challenge that a little bit. Uh, th- there was a noticeable change in the early 1970s, and we only uh, the Amer- U.S. has only hit replacement level fertility in two instances since the early 1970s. And and so the financial crisis in the late 2000s, 2008, 2009, it's an easily identifiable time period where, uh, where people point to and say, well, that makes sense. You know, people were unsure of their future. The economy took some really big hits and the outlook of, of having children changed. I don't think it was that finite. I, I think that trend has been well in place since the early 1970s. And there was a trajectory where it came up. And actually, that's kind of where I fit in. So I'm, I'm 51 years old right now. And I was born in 1973. And so my parents were early baby boomers. And so like a lot of the baby boomers, of course, they had children. And so my wife and I started to have children. Our first child was born in 2003. 2000, we have three of them, 2003, 2005, and 2007. And uh, it's, it's a fairly natural timeline of children of baby boomers and when the likelihood of them having, having children themselves would be. And then, of course, as that crest kind of came back around, the, there's a natural uh, group of people that um, you know, start to look at things a little differently. So when you look at the root causes of the changes of that fertility rate, the obvious thing in, in the early 1970s is the advent of uh, birth control. And so for the first time, you added into this equation an element of choice, which uh, as a matter of forward progress of society, that's hard to say that's not good, right? You got an element of choice in there that people are able to decide for themselves what kind of life they want to lead, and when and how they want to bring children into their lives, if, if at all. The other component of the declining fertility rate it has a lot to do with the education levels of people, and in particular women, right? So when, when a society is made up of educated women, they have the tendency to make choices that are not consistent with having a whole lot of children in, uh, like they did, uh, you know, 100 years ago whether it's uh, more choice of a career path or maybe they want to find the right person to settle down with. Uh, so again, there's an element there that's it's difficult to argue with. I mean, education, improving it, and having everybody in this country, in this world for that matter, more educated, again, hard to argue with. That's a pretty good thing to have happen. It's just the outcome of that is uh, people are deciding to uh, take longer to settle down, if you will, whether it's finding the right person to, to commit to, whether it's a, a traditional marriage or a similar kind of relationship. And then the concept of having children, if they want to have children, it's just a fact that when you have a society made up of more older women versus more younger women, just by natural selection situation, you're going to have fewer children being born. So can these trends be reversed? Well, I think that question also has to start with, should we try to? And I think there's some reasonable conversation to have there, whether it's individual conversations that that couples have around their kitchen tables or perhaps larger in in societal conversations and and civic um, thought processes. Uh, if, If there is a desire then I think there are probably a lot of things that can be done to try to help it. For the most part, across the globe, other countries that have tried to increase the level of fertility across their societies, that's been a pretty big failure across the board. There's been a lot of countries that have tried to do things in a lot of different ways and slight movement of the needle here and there, but by far and large, it's difficult to change the trajectory of this. And you just think about it from a common sense standpoint. If somebody makes a decision, so if an American couple makes a decision, say, to not have, have children, 
trying to convince them that they should, that's a tall order. And I'm not so sure that's it's anybody's business but their own. Nonetheless, there are real implications of having fewer children in a society. And, and those are the things that I'm really trying to bring to the surface in the book. What countries do you think are least positioned for the future of less children? And what, what countries are, on the flip side, the best positioned? Well, I suppose y- you really need to look at the big one, which would be China, right? So China obviously was, up till last year, to a certain degree, maybe three years ago, to certain other numbers. But up till that time period, they were the, that was the, the most populous country in the world. It, it, it's now India. And so when you have such a large country growing so fast, they had a lot of policies from a government standpoint that, that really changed their own path. So the, the, for a long time, they instituted what they had called their one-child policy. And that was, for whatever reason, an attempt to slow down the growth of the population, allowing people to only have one child. Uh, that started to take hold. And within a very short period of time, I'd have to go back into my notes to tell you exactly how long, but in a very short period of time, they went from a one-child policy to a two-child policy to a three-child policy to an, to now having a policy of actually encouraging fertility. And in fact, the government is subsidizing and outright paying for fertility treatments and in vitro treatments. So China is really a, kind of a an entire conversation in and of itself. In my adult life, I have seen the rise of China from an from a economic standpoint. And I do believe in my adult life, I will see the demise of China in, in that same economic view. Uh, a lot of other uh, Asian countries are experiencing the same kinds of issues. South Korea, very, very problematic in their fertility. Um, that's a situation where it, it, it could they could leave themselves so vulnerable to, to, to just being taken over to from another cultural society. There's a lot of wacky geopolitical imp- in, impacts there. But uh, there are many other places in the world, uh, Eastern Europe, Southern, Southern Europe as well. In fact, I would suggest that there's virtually no place in the world besides Sub-Saharan Africa that are not facing this eminent threat of this trend. And I would even further suggest that several parts of Africa, to include parts of sub-Saharan Africa, are already seeing reductions of fertility rates. Now, they're starting from a higher level, and it's going to take them a little bit longer to get down to the levels that uh, a lot of other parts of the world. Uh, But make no mistake, this is a trend that is happening globally, just at different rates across different parts of the world. I don't remember the exact name of the study, but it was some study that I think that was conducted in like the 60s or 70s. It was like the whole like mouse utopia thing, right? Where they, you ever hear about that that study where they crammed out these mice and gave them unlimited food and water and then they just kept reproducing and then eventually they just had basically a population collapse, right? You had like the pretty ones where they just groomed themselves all day. I'm not really sure what the ideal carrying capacity of the world is according to mother nature, but it seems like once the population just hits a certain point, just basically due to, to when people start having less kids with higher education, with what, contraceptives, things like that you mentioned, and so this happens all over. China basically went from the 1980s to having a bunch of people dying of starvation to having this booming economy of factory workers and booming population. And all of a sudden now they're still... I mean, in, in my lifetime, right? I mean, basically seeing China rise and fall within one generation is really insane to see. And then people are saying, oh, like India, now that they surpass China as the largest population in the world, like, oh, they're going to be the next global superpower. I guess I really, really don't, don't, don't see it. Do you think there is such a thing as like a carrying capacity of the world, it just seems like it's following these mouse utopian experiments, and they've redone those mouse studies, and it's always the the same thing. Like they hit a peak population, and then they just start collapsing. The mouse stop re- reproducing, and they start you know killing each other. And it's not just in humans; it's any animal, really. Yeah. So I, I, when you when you think about those kinds of concepts and those thoughts, right? That, that's some of the concerns that really led to 
what I would consider to be a, a, an overestimating the size and circumstance of the situation. Right? So the, the population bomb, Paul Ehrlich's book that that is easily pointing to in that circumstance, that that kind of a, um, a sense of hysteria, right? And there was that that mouse study. Uh, th there's certainly a lot of weight to that. However, I, I think that underestimates the impact of societal changes and, and cultural impacts. And it'll, it'll have a lot to do with how societies want to deal with the changing landscape. Uh, the, the whole concept is, is growing out of control and, and having people dying in the streets. Uh, I, I just, I don't, really like that part of the, the conversation. I have a tendency to really look at it from a, a more nuts and bolts, fundamental point of view. Uh, the, the carrying capacity, uh, you know, it was once thought that we could never produce enough food in the world for all of our population. I mean, we, we have endless opportunities to produce food in the world these days. And uh, the concept of not being able to do something to provide for the for our population, I just don't subscribe to it. Really, I, I think we, as uh, especially from the entrepreneurial standpoint, where there's a need, there'll be a there'll be a, a solution that'll be created. I had Tim Kearney on the podcast. He wrote a book called Family Unfriendly, and he kind of talked about safetyism, where it's just harder to have kids, like multiple kids. Back in the day, you just throw you know your four kids into the back of the station wagon and. And go off to the grocery store. Now, of course, you can't do that. You got to have a special car seat. And if you leave the kids in the station wagon and you go into the store, you're going to have the cops called on you and arrested for child end endangerment. He basically just says, like, a lot of like it would, it would, people are just having less kids because it's just harder to have, you know, to raise them and it's more expensive. And he kind of thought that maybe in his, at least his group, that people are kind of just over the whole safetyism thing. And that pendulum's kind of swinging. I mean, I, I was born in 1982. That was, you know, how I grew up. It's just like, yeah, you shove four people into the back of a station wagon and I'd be sitting in the parking lot for two hours. You know, of course, this is before a smartphone and all that stuff. I'm just sitting in there, you know, by myself at like nine years old for two hours, but and no one ever thought anything of it. But now it's like you do that and you're probably going to be thrown in jail. If we could make it easier, like hey, that's his whole point. Like, you make it easier to have kids, people will have more kids you know i mean i guess is you know i think that's you know there's a very practical interpretation there and i i certainly wouldn't disagree with it to a large degree i mean uh, like i said a moment ago I've, I've uh my wife and i have, have three kids and uh like you i was definitely one of those people in the back of the station wagon too so uh the the cultural impacts of that uh I, I for sure we can we can do things that are more family friendly, and I certainly have a couple chapters in the book that I talk about those different things. And different societies have tried some of those things. I, I think for me, it's it's important to understand what's the motivation. What are you trying to accomplish? Because if you're going to try to entice people to have more children, that's not all that easy to do. If you want to have a society that is more welcoming and friendly to having children and work towards that goal. I certainly don't see any challenges with it. I think at a certain point, the economics have to re really evaluate it because there's been a lot of societies across the globe that have tried similar, similar kinds of policies to, and, and it really doesn't, it really doesn't move the needle in the big picture. And, and uh, again, I'm, I'm not necessarily suggesting we should or shouldn't, uh, I'm just trying to make observations on what the circumstance really is in, in, the, in the scenario that we're in and, and, and really from a practical standpoint, uh, how do we best uh, get through it, cope with the situation and, and, and hopefully succeed on the other side. Uh, the, the, those, the, the, you know, the concepts of larger societal conversations, uh, I'm just really a business guy who making some observations on some major trends People need to make up their own decisions, and, and collectively as a society, we need to make those common thought processes and the societal norms based on how we want to run our society and culture in general. In your book, you're talking about Dallas, and you're saying about how all these people are moving to Dallas, like they got a lot of jobs, they're having these larger families, so then they're building these larger homes, big yards, and then you're saying basically like in 20 years, when these 
families are all grown up and moved out of these houses, like who's going to buy these houses? The older generation, they don't want big houses. They don't want houses with massive yards. You, you think you're going to have some 80 year old walking around with a cane, you know, trying to cut the grass or use the leaf blower or whatever. Right. So, I mean, I, th- I thought that was interesting, right? Like, what do you see the feel like real estate, right? Everyone thinks like, oh, like, oh, p- less people. Great. The housing prices are, are down. Well, what about the vast majority of people where their biggest asset and the vast majority of their net worth is wrapped up in the equity of their house? They're, they'd be decimated if housing- Yeah, there's you know there, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. I'll, I'll start with the last part first. When you look at the concept of the long-term asset value of a, of a piece of property, of a, of a piece of real estate, of a home, the American dream of having the house with the white picket fence and you pay off your mortgage and you own it outright and at some point you retire and you live off of your nest egg, uh, the long-term asset uh, appreciation model needs to be reevaluated. And that's kind of one of those businesses and those sectors that uh, if that's part of your world, you need to think about that. And, and so if, if you're talking about home ownership, what is the property value, regardless of the location or the, the, uh, the sought after nature of certain neighborhoods or whatever, but what, what's a property worth when there are four homes available for every three people that need one? It, 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 it goes down. Uh, and and so uh, that whole concept of holding on to your home and having your home being your largest asset, uh, I'm not a financial investor, I mean, advisor, but I can tell you that I am talking to some people that are taking my topic here and turning it into a thematic investment platform, doing exactly that. I, and I'll, I'll take it one step further, what you just said about the homes and the, the you know, things like uh, Houston. Uh, I, I was just looking at a, a fresh piece of a report that was released from the Census Bureau earlier this week, and it had a lot to do with the uh, building permits issued across the country, housing starts, and the uh, the houses that were recently finished and sold, right? So talk about the leading edge of the real estate sector. Well, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but the vast majority of all the housing that's being created right now, that's being built right now, is over four, it's four bedrooms, it has three car garages, and it's got almost 4,000 square feet of living space. And so that does not jive with what our cultural societal makeup is going to be in 20 years, 15 years, completely different direction. In your book, you mentioned like how these houses with uh, a shrinking population would be kind of like cars, right? You buy a car and what do they say? The second you drive it off that parking lot, you lose like 25% of its value. Well, as soon as you buy a house, that house is going to be worth less, you know, two seconds later than the time you bought it. And it isn't it like Japan, isn't Japan like that? In Japan, you buy a house, you sell it seven years later and they just buy the thing at a, ha- a fraction of the price, knock it down, rebuild a new one and move on, right? Yeah, so the, different economies uh, handle situations different ways. You know, Japan's a really interesting country to look at. And a couple of minutes ago, you asked me about the other countries in the world and what they're facing. Japan, such a unique circumstance. One is that they, they're one of the, uh, pretty much the only country in the world that didn't have a baby boom after World War II. And, and of course, had a lot to do with the destruction associated with the war. Uh, another thing is that they're, the way their cultural societal works is they don't really look upon immigration as a positive thing. They're kind of a closed society when it comes to that. And then when it comes to the financials, they've kind of got this unusual thing of their their financial debt is carried by themselves, right? So flipping a house like you just said in Japan, the relative value of it never gets truly materialized and come, becomes tangible because kind of comes out in the wash a little bit when you're talking about the overall operation of the government. So, uh, you know, housing, uh, I think the biggest issue with the housing that I would suggest is more than having too many homes, which is something that I, another thing that I kind of, um, I take that position virtually, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there that suggest we've got a massive shortage of homes in, in, in across the country. In certain ways, in certain circumstances, uh, that could be that could be true. But the number of households we have in in America and what's on the front end of uh, formation of those households does not jive with that kind of thought. 
But more importantly, I think it's a matter of what kind of homes we have, what kind of living situations do we have, and are we adequately prepared? And and so uh, things like convenience of living and what does it take to make a home something, uh, someplace that is comfortable for an older person to live, right? So let's start with basic things like, well, probably shouldn't have too many sets of stairs, right? Obviously, your point earlier of probably doesn't need to have five acres of grass that needs to be manicured and cut. Uh, but even more so, the planning associated with where the, that, that property is. You can't just take those houses in, in, in one of those areas, just to continue to, to, to focus on Houston, for example. If you just simply made those houses single floor living and uh, in wide hallways and, and less grass to manicure, they still wouldn't fit with our societal requirements because they're spread apart quite a bit. And there's no easy access to, say, for example, uh, health care or your basic needs of prescription drugs or groceries. You've got to be planned in that regard and be able to have that those requirements and those needs accessible to those people. And that's what I think we, we really need to focus on is are we adequately prepared for what's happening or what, what's going to be our, our cultural situation? And and my really answer is is no, and we should be doing a lot more about it. Well, the last several years, the fastest growing community in the U.S. has been the villages of Florida, the 55 plus community. And I mean, these are all things that have been thought out and planned out for decades. You think we'll see more 55 plus communities around uh, North America and globally? Well, I think the challenge there is that 55 plus doesn't doesn't get it done. That area has grown quite a bit, mostly be, and, and it's tracked pretty much identical to the uh, to the, the uh, significance and the progression of the baby boomer generation. And so, uh, there is no baby boomer group that's 40 and about to be 55 in 15 years. That window of opportunity has already passed. Uh, now, that doesn't, doesn't mean to suggest that a place like the Villages can't be wildly successful, because obviously it is. But if you were to look upon that and choose that as a business model and go try to build another 50 of them, it wouldn't play out because the people just simply are not there. Uh, there, there will be likely, uh, uh, when you look at the way neighborhoods and, and regions are here in America, it'll, it'll start to take shape a lot like uh, areas of Europe. Right, villages have grown smaller and smaller, and that's that's already happening here in America. I suppose that's something that most people don't recognize is already actually happening, but it really is. Parts of uh, Michigan and Illinois, and Wisconsin, and uh, upstate New York, a whole lot of areas in Pennsylvania, they're, they're already dealing with the realities of a declining population, and they're looking at it. As, as kind of planning, and that's just kind of what happens. And the narrative in the, in the populist media would suggest, well, they're going from blue states to red states, and the older, older retirees are going to less areas of taxation. And that certainly is the case. But don't look past the basic understanding that there are just simply fewer people across the entire country. There just simply are fewer. And if you look at the numbers, you'll find that to be true. So Dell Webb was a developer in the 1950s he broke ground in sun city arizona with the first 55 plus community and now there's a bunch of other like you know either sun city west or other dell web kind of elements 55 plus communities there's one in like hilton head south carolina i think there's one outside vegas there's a bunch but if you were the modern day dell web you know the 2024 dell web what kind of developments are you creating then well, I, I'll, I'll take the, uh, I'll say you know, first and foremost, the word creating needs to be reconsidered because we probably don't need to create too much more. We probably need to consider recreating a lot of what we have. And, and the economics of that uh, certainly changes and, and varies across different municipalities and, and, and regions of the country. We've got a lot of structures, right? We've got a lot of Buildings, office buildings, homes, schools, universities that uh, we probably should look to repurposing. And so the modern business developer looking to conquer the next space 
probably be found in what's the secret sauce there? How do you how do you take the various buildings we have across the country? Malls, apartment complexes, large tract homes. And how do we reevaluate them and repurpose them into functioning uh, meeting places and societal gathering spots and having the right places for the goods and services needed for the local community? Uh, that's probably what, what I would say is, uh, uh, is probably the next feature in the developer. And I would certainly say uh, if anybody wants to go into commercial real estate these days, uh, I'm not a commercial real estate developer, but that's something, that's a sector I wouldn't suggest going into. And when Daryl Brooker was on, he was talking about commercial real estate. And it's basically like you're getting decimated, particularly because of this remote work. If you got a thousand employees and say you have, I don't know, you, hey, each one come in one day a week. I mean, you could have a fraction of the space. And you see San Francisco, I mean, buildings are selling for a fraction of the price before you know, pandemic and as the telecommunications, telemedicine, just telework, as that technology improves even further. I mean, I I imagine in, I don't know, less than 10 years from now, we're going to have holograms. I mean, you're going to be sitting at a meeting with all your coworkers moving, you know, boxes and shit around like in, in real time, right? In the next decade. I mean, why would you, you could be in Indonesia or China or Japan working in the U.S. or vice versa. The commercial real estate, I think, is decimated, not just now, but going forward. Yeah, and and I suppose that's, that's a fairly obvious thing to look at right now, right? Obviously, 15, 20 years ago, uh, perhaps uh, it w wasn't so obvious to look at as a trend. Uh, I would suggest, though, too, that the general assumptions uh, – like, for example, what you just said, you've got a bunch of coworkers around and dealing with holograms. Uh, if, you, if you really dive into the topic and, and understand the trajectory of these things, you need to consider that the number of coworkers you have is going to be fewer. So that coworker next to you might be more of a machine or a machine process than another person in another area, whether they're at home or in an office building. That'll probably be one of the more transformative topics, I think, in the next, say, 15, 20 years, maybe 10, is uh, how does that truly work? How, how is it that you take what's now, say, an office of 15 people, and, and how, do, how does that change to, say, eight people, but producing something of equal or better quality and, and value I suppose it, change, it it has a lot to do with the sector you're you're working in, uh, but automation is is absolutely part of the equation. And we'd probably be pretty well served to think about what our society looks like when we're sitting next to some robots or some machines rather than coworkers. Yeah, I've, I've watched this YouTube channel. It's one of the like the partners or one of the people that has followed the rich dad poor dad guy but he's like this billionaire and investor and he basically says converting commercial real estate to residential is really hard because let's just say hypothetically you have a, a warehouse or an office and you have one centralized bathroom well then you gotta replumb the whole place which is going to cost millions of dollars and then with all the regulations, first off, you just got to you have to rezone it from commercial to residential. If you have a bedroom, you have to have some type of window. But if it's like this really, it's like a warehouse where it's just really this expansive space. How are you even going to get bed? You know, so then you have to make them like really skinny and narrow. And like I said, just with the plumbing, running the electrical, there's all sorts of different requirements. Even if you get the building for free, you end up having these spaces that are uber expensive. There's just so many technicalities with it. It seems like a lot of these buildings would be really hard, at least with the current regulations and and now with the rising interest rates, it seems like it'd be pretty hard to convert. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There's there's a whole lot of challenges there, right? And they're probably not just a one-for-one -one swap, right? You don't just take an office building and compl completely convert it into to condominiums or apartments or such. And, and those complexities are certainly there. And so those are solutions for people to come up with products and services to, to help marry up with that need. And, and perhaps some of them just get uh, knocked down and, and, and redone with something else. Uh, 
another thing about all this topic in general is the the second and third and fourth derivative issues associated with it. So what we're talking about here, right, is the collapse of commercial real estate. Well, how about the taxes of that commercial real estate and the importance of those taxes to the locale and the functional aspects of that government? If that tax revenue goes down even ever so slightly, major implications are, are felt on the budgetary side. And so now all of a sudden you've got a, a municipality that has to look at squaring away the books and, and you're going to take a good hard look at money in, money out. And, and that alone is going to be a pretty significant feat to, to try to accomplish. And even more so of, of you got to be prepared for that. You, your, your modeling has to be has to be at least not erroneously crazy wrong. You know what I mean? It's very hard to be accurate, but it's not hard to be ridiculously not wrong, right? And when you're talking about that tax base, let's say you have an office with a thousand people going in Monday through Friday. Well, maybe they're hitting the Starbucks or the coffee shop in the morning before work, then they hit some restaurants for lunch, and maybe they hit a couple of bars of the coworkers on the way out. Every single one of those is decimated. You're not just losing the tax base from the office building, you're losing the tax base from the coffee shop, the bars, the restaurants, I don't know, maybe the dry cleaning, maybe the tailoring service, maybe the, you know, you could name, uh, I don't know, the dozens of auxiliary businesses based on this one office building, right? My gosh. I mean, think about that, right? Just think in your mind, you know, one one of the cities or major areas that are easily reminded or, you know, rememberable to you. And you think about, you know, so for me, obviously, I can think about right here in Boston. Uh, everything you just described is is spot on. And it's easy to see where problems happen, right? There's, there's a complete bottoming out that, that goes on. So now what are we going to do about it? You know, what kind of what kind of things can we look at what, what kind of issues can we bring up to, to mitigate the impacts of these things. And it starts first and foremost with really understanding what we've got and, and, and the reality of the circumstance. And you got to try to prevent some sort of massive disaster. That's, that's it's first and foremost what you got to do. And then when you prevent a massive disaster, you, you try to prevent a, a few bar, smaller problems. And then once you start getting to the, the problem solving area, then you're going to think to yourself, all right, what are we going to do now? What kind of what kind of business are we in now? What kind of business should we be in in the future? And and that includes municipalities. Right? You can't just you can't just have a street sweeper going down those streets if there's no garbage on the streets, right? Yeah, and the street sweeper. I mean, that's that's just one municipality person, right? How many police officers do you need if there's and that, and that's the hard part is like maybe we need to shrink this government down, but then the the politicians, the people in the town council and whatnot probably don't want to the chief of police doesn't the sergeant you know like there's just all these conflict of interest i think it's right. you get into self preser self preservation mode i mean it's the whole i mean was it upton sinclair who basically said like if some person's salary depends on it and you need them not to understand they won't understand i forget the exact expression but it's you know it's something to like but it's totally true i mean i i see and yeah. i've seen it and yeah. so many jobs i worked in i mean and, I, and i've worked in municipalities i mean it's it's tough because it, it's certain it's almost like trying to catch a falling knife, right? It's 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 a tricky thing for sure, but it, but it's something that we have to be prepared for, and it starts with having a basic handle of the facts and figures. In the book, it seemed like one of your solutions was like we're going to need to get people to work longer, and you mentioned in France how they pushed up the age of re retirement. They had they had protests in the street, right? But did, I think they they actually ended up following through and making that age two years longer. Isn't that correct? I thought that they actually, did they, they finalize that? Well, right? I think the, 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 the real jury is probably still out on that one. That, um, okay. I, I haven't followed the latest, but that was Macron's major, uh, major initiative he wanted to accomplish. I think he couldn't get it through a certain way. And I think he, he, he penned it in due to his powers. And I, I'm pretty sure Politically, right now, he might be on the outs. Might be because of one of those major issues like that. Uh, you know, working working later. Uh, well, it, it, I guess it depends on what kind of society we we really want to live in. You know, my, my parents have have worked later. It's not something that they have had a particular problem with. You know, they like working, and then if people want to work, we should we should have uh, atmospheres in place that's that's. It's comfortable for them to work in. 
and obviously you're not going to be uh you know you're not going to be a roofer on the top of a house at, in a summer's day when you're 76 years old banging nails but surely we can find ways to utilize the skills and experience of our elders however they they would like and, and we should we should take that into consideration in the, the the society structure we have and businesses in particular should make it a point to do that not because it's a it's a it's a right thing to do and and you can have a conversation about that for sure but i'm talking about it from a, a basic element of business preservation standpoint uh if, if you can't make an atmosphere a working environment that's that somebody who is older wants to work in you might have to face the fact that you might not have a worker to be there to begin with and uh, that's really important in your book you basically mention how social security was started in 1935 under FDR part of the new deal and the average age of a of a person i think it was a man in 1935 was 58 and so social security was 65 so very very few people were even eligible for social security you know at that point anyways and then as you mentioned in the book in 1940 42 workers were paying in to every one worker that was pulling out those benefits but if if we were to extrapolate that in in 2024 the age of 65 that would essentially be the equivalent of like upper 80s right i mean if it actually pegged to gains in in life expectancy so i mean i think people would be like you said would probably have these revolts like we saw in france but if it was pegged to gains in life expectancy the retirement age would be significantly older than 65 to say the least yeah yeah i mean social security has been long talked about right i think one of the challenges is that it's been talked about in in the concept of uh baby boomers retiring and the in the impact that they'll have in the system and although that's not wrong and and not and not it's not incorrect to look at it that way, but I would suggest that a, a bigger issue is the the thing that you're trying to identify there is that the people paying in is is fewer. And in fact, the 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 front of the book is is got this imagery associated with the population pyramid, right? So most people look at it as 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 a pyramid of of uh, uh, of a group of people, younger people at the bottom, older people at the top, right? So collectively, we usually have fewer older people and, and a whole lot of younger people. And, and in fact, that's just the way everything associated with societal development has always been. And, and other than, uh, you know, some massive areas of plague across the, the world, the, the, the world has never seen uh, this kind of implication. And so when you're thinking about Social Security, you got to look at it from an inverted pyramid, right? And so now you got a lot more people up at the top and not a lot of people down below. So it's only math, right? So what, what are you going to do there? Right? You either pay less for the people that are getting it, the people that are paying into it pay a whole lot more, or or modify the rules of it. And, and apparently, you know, politically these days, that's a topic that nobody seems to want to touch. And, and I, you get some lip service here and there, but it's unfortunate because it, it's really a great demonstration of the problem we have here. We, I, my book is all about trying to bring to the surface the fact that we've got not just a lot of older people in our society, but more importantly, an absence, a big gaping hole of younger people. And the societal safety nets like Social Security, you, you have to do something about it. And, you know, the national debt, the borrowing levels of, of the country also come into play. And again, it, it's not necessarily about uh, what we should do politically there. Uh, what I think is, is most important is just to have a, a, a real observation of exactly what the facts and figures are. And then I think people can have reasonable conversation. And, and, and those reasonable conversations, and sometimes they might not be so reasonable, but they need to happen. People need to have uh, dialogue about what to do with these circumstances. And my major concern is that businesses in particular will be caught flat-footed 
And that's one of the motivating factors I had when I wrote the book. Today's guest is Dustin Whitney, author of the book Demographic Deception, Exposing the Overpopulation Myth and Building a Resilient Future. Dustin, thanks for jo- thank you for joining us today. I just have two final questions. Just can you let people know where they can find your book, get a hold of you, that kind of information that you want to provide. And then after that, leave us with a final thought, whether that's related to your book, to the demographics, or just anything that you are currently working on or on your mind. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. The book is certainly available on Amazon, uh, any other place that people want to buy their books, but Amazon would be the place I would ask people to buy the book. DustinWhitney.com is my website. There's some additional information there on some of the projects I'm involved with and what I'm ultimately trying to accomplish. Uh, I think when it comes to wrapping up some thoughts on, on the book and the topic in general, uh, there's, a, there's an element of what I'm trying to do, and we didn't, we didn't get into it too much uh, here, but there's an element of what I'm trying to accomplish, of trying to make the world a better place and do things in the whole concept of uh, leaving something better than you first came across it. Uh, uh, like we, like I said earlier in the conversation here, I've got three children and it's really my children that are going to have to deal with the major societal impacts of the implications of this topic. Uh, and, and so it's selfishly at the same time, I'm probably going to be one of those 80 year olds that, uh, probably doesn't have enough nursing care around them to adequately, uh, help. I'm looking for, ways that we can help bring these things to the surface and drive solutions. From a a business standpoint too, what I'm doing is that I'm in the process of evaluating all the different major implications and sectors of of the most impacted areas and aligning myself with strategic partners for long-term planning and and navigating these waters. So uh, if you you see this podcast, you, you hear about the topic, please reach out. Solutions are available. There are things that we can do to help prepare and navigate around these these topics. Uh, you know, one other analogy I might kind of put into into place there is towards the end of the book, I draw this connection to a plane landing. Most people have been on airplanes, and most people, when they when they land on an airplane, it's kind of one of two circumstances. At least here in America, for the most part, there's the circumstance where you kind of you're, you're approaching ground, and you're and the and the the, the pilot puts the the rear wheels down first, and then just kind of floats the the front end of the uh, of the airplane down, and you just kind of coast to the uh, to the gate, if you will. And then there's the the the, the landing that is much more abrupt. And it's kind of like you're all of a sudden you're in the air, and then boom, you're on the ground, and you hit the brakes hard. Uh, I think most people uh, have had those kinds of circumstances. And that's kind of um, uh, the, the reason for that uh, is because most pilots are either uh, are trained by the military and uh, Air Force pilots are, are, are taught to land a plane like that nice and soft and gingerly, mostly because they've got plenty of runway, long areas to, uh, to, uh, to navigate around. Navy pilots are instructed and in, in, in taught to land a plane very quick. And, and, you know, for example, you think about trying to land a, a fighter jet on top of a, an aircraft carrier, it's, you don't have a lot of wiggle room, right? So it's like, boom, get it down there. Uh, the analogy I'm trying to make here is that if we were facing a, a decline of our population that was kind of just slowly happening and, and we had a chance to adjust uh, accordingly and everything kind of came out in the wash over, say, 50 or 60 years or something like that, there'd be a different circumstance than what we're facing. What we're facing right now is a very abrupt transition. It's a very dramatic shift. And it's something that is going to shake, shake out. You know, you know my, my real timeline here is between the, the years of 2020 to 2030 or 2035. And so we're, we're probably one third of the way through that right now. 2030 is a time period that I'm looking at as like the beginning of that massive shift being impacted and felt. And then 2035, that, that five-year stretch, depending on industries and sectors of, of when they might go through some mass, massive transformation. And then I, I'll, I look out on the timeline of, of 2050 and further. It, it's very challenging to look out that far. It's, it's not really pragmatic. 
automation, robotics, uh, technology in general, the future of the world, so many things that are very difficult to pr project into the future. But uh, when you when you think about things in timelines like that, you know, 2030, 2035, it's not too far down the road. And and so these impacts are, are being felt now. So take a look around you, understand where you are, what kind of imp implications this has to you, whether you're a worker, whether you're a business owner, a, a societal person, somebody who's generally concerned about your neighborhood, your, your municipality, take a good hard look around and, and, and maybe start some of this dialogue because uh, it's meaningful, it's important, and we need to make some progress on it. And you, you kind of mentioned just before you go about some of these large impacts. Is there any like large impacts? Can you kind of give us like that, that timeline, which is, just, is good, but is there any large impacts that we didn't? we didn't discuss that you referenced harari in your book he's most famous as like sapiens but he has another book i'm basically talking about this post-covid world he basically says the average person is useless i think he calls them the useless class and 85 percent of people are basically going to be without jobs and you know who knows what i mean i think you know, he's part of the world economic forum and i think some of his you know i generally don't like to talk about him too much because i think he's pretty far out there, but are there some big impacts that we didn't discuss that you want to bring up? Well, uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about societal implications, you know, what, what daily life looks like, feels like, right? The, the challenges in general, the study of economics is all about forward progress. The basic equation of say GDP, right? The GDP is basically the, 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 the element of productivity times labor. And there is no negative model of economics. Uh, I think one of the interesting things to consider that we haven't really talked about would be uh, what does an economic model look like when it shrinks, when it's, when it's negative? I, I would say that the academics out there are probably going to study this a good amount over the next handful of years, uh, wh especially when it starts poking its, its face in front of people. The whole notion of decline is something that we've never really seen, right? From a, from a commercial scenario, certainly America has never seen. We've seen some, some dips of stuff, right? Wartime, some challenges, some, some recessions, uh, but an actual negative economy, a shrinking economy. What does a shrinking economy really look like? How do you define success in that economy? And, and what are then the the geopolitical implications of that, and perhaps how might that change our global landscape? Uh, there's some stuff there to, to noodle on and to consider, and maybe we could have another conversation about that on another time if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I think you know Peter Zeehan in his book, you know, basically says that essentially, I think because of that, not just zero growth but negative growth, there's just going to have to be different economic models and different political models to essentially handle it. And then do we have those economic models or political models at this point? Uh, prob probably not. Well, I, I would suggest that if you were to just open up any economics textbook, there's, there's nothing that's even talking about it. You know, right. survey uh, a major economist across this country and the, the students that they're teaching, they're certainly not talking about it. It's not in their syllabus. Uh, I, I know that. I interface with, with, with some of those people in, in, it's not, and that's a that's that's a shame because we they they really ought to be. There needs to be some authorities in the in the future that understand the science behind it and the and the, and the mathematics, and perhaps that might come out as as some of the awareness of this topic becomes more and more well known. And and so I appreciate your your interest in the conversation and the topic. I I, I really do. Do you think that Japan could possibly be a model? They're the only country that's actually been experiencing this population decline for years. There's a lot of automation. People are always like, oh, whenever you go to Japan, it's all automated. It's like, yeah, they've had to automate for the last 30 years because they just don't have people. So like, that's the one, the only example we really have of what a future would look like would possibly be, be Japan, but that's even skewed because they're able to outsource offshore manufacturing. That's exactly right. Right. That's so. exactly right. And I spent a little time on, on the, in the book on that. Uh, it's unfortunate that we just don't have anything to really pull upon. When when Japan was going through that crunch, when they really needed people, 
they had China right next to them with a whole bunch of people, with a whole bunch of factories. And they were able to completely offshore everything they needed. Uh, that's not the case anymore. So, uh, you know, there, 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 there are challenges. And, and so uh, more important than anything else is, is basic understanding of what the real math is and, uh, and then having some real conversation about the practical implications and what things really look like and, and, and what we can do as a result. My dear friends, that is it for this episode of El Podcast. Once again, if you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube as well as Rumble. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. We thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for watching and listening, and we will see you on the next episode.